All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our final session today. Today's final session will be on answering skeptics. want to also encourage and invite you to, not trying to pull you away from maybe your church home, but if you would like to just take a little vacation and hear a little more from, <laughs> no. should have scheduled it that way though. I hear you guys are rigging the way this system works, so we, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you'd like to hear a little more from Carl, uh, tomorrow he'll be taking our Sunday school hour, our morning worship, and then our Sunday evening session. He'll be talking about there is no truth debunked, becoming bold, know it, live it, share it in the 1030 session. And then in the six o'clock session, you can get something from nothing debunked. So again, three more sessions tomorrow if you'd like to come and join us. It will be, it will be live streamed. Uh, on YouTube, and we could probably do it on Facebook too, couldn't we? Or since we, yeah, so yeah, so we'll we'll try to make sure it's available there for you. If nothing else, it definitely is on YouTube. All of our sessions are on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, Gretna Beast, uh, Gretna Baptist Church, and it's all there. So, having said that, we're gonna encourage you uh, also if you would like to give to support the needs of this ministry, uh, the NARBC. Uh, fellowship. Uh, this young man back there in the red shirt is holding up a box. You can take your gift and put it inside that box, and uh, we will certainly use it to offset the cost of this conference. We appreciate anything you may give in that regard and uh, try to be stewards of those gifts. Also, we want to encourage you to stick around if you don't have plans for this evening. Uh, I think we have plenty of room, plenty of opportunity for you to stick around and learn a little bit more about our camping ministry. Maybe you're not familiar with our fellowship or familiar with our camp. This would be a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about what we're doing. Uh, as the Nebraska Association of Regular Baptist Churches uh, that we are a part of, we have an opportunity. God has blessed us with about 90 acres uh, there in Genoa, Nebraska. And as Phil mentioned, we have an opportunity to minister to over 700 people each camping season. What an amazing opportunity that is to be able to just set aside some time and focus, get away from the distractions of this world and just focus in God's creation and focus on the Word of God. So uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about that after our break, um, you can stick around for the camp banquet where you can learn all you want to learn about camp. Also, encourage you as you leave this session here today, uh, encourage you to go into the fellowship hall so they can get set up in here for camp and uh, spend some time fellowshipping with our missionaries, get to know them, visit their tables, and also spend some time with each other uh, fellowshipping, okay? Uh, you've been out there not wanting to come in because you're fellowshipping so great, so you should, here's your opportunity after the session, right? So, a uh, great opportunity. Let's go ahead and begin our worship. Let's stand together as we sing. By faith, we see the hand of God. Amen. Our fathers roam the earth, and 
doesn't seem to be very significant or important thing I'm holding in my hands. And yet, through the commitment of a little community in the Philippines, lives are being changed. Just two dollars. You never realize how much two dollars can make a difference. You know what I appreciate about Carl and his ministry? It's so diverse, right? It's so diverse. And he's made connections and relationships all over with so many different people. And this little community in the Philippines is taking the $2 that you donate from each one of these bracelets and changing the lives of people in the Philippines. I encourage you, uh, when you go out tonight, um, before you leave or wherever you're going from here, Go drop a couple dollars in that box and grab one of these, okay? Um, and make a difference in the life of some folks in the Philippines. So you ready for our last session? Again, so pleased to have reasons of hope with us. Carl, come and challenge our hearts, please. Thank you. to this little village. He's a missionary in the Philippines. He's got to raise his own support to be there. He goes to this village and uh, he got super discouraged because a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't be going on. We don't need to talk about it. It was ugly stuff. And he's like, what can I do to help? Everybody was pushy trying to sell something. And one lady came up and she had these wristbands and she's like, would you like to buy some wristbands? He said, no, thank you. And she was polite. And she said, well, if you decide to buy some, Please remember me. Because she was polite, he said to himself, I'm going to help her. So, uh, and by the way, I tell young people all the time, you want to stand out in our culture? You don't need purple hair. You don't need a mohawk. And you don't need to walk around half naked. That's what the world does, right? That's boring. What you need is to be polite, kind, nice, sane. You're going to shine in a culture of meanness. And that's where we are, unfortunately. So he came back the day before he left. He found her. He said, I'd like to buy $100 worth of wristbands. He said, Carl, she froze. I don't have $100 worth of wristbands. He said, here. Gave her the $100. He said, I'll be back next month and I'll pick up the wristbands. Thinking that she's going to take the money and run, right? He came back the next month. She gave him a big bag of wristbands. He said, ma'am, that's too much. And she said, no, that's $100 worth. And I fed my family on that $100. So now he's like, what am I going to do with, this, uh, with all these wristbands? He went out and he started selling them. All right. Hey, Pastor Brian, would you would you bring those to me, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, bring those back to me if you would. I got a, I got a purpose for him. Um, he said, uh, she, she froze, got the big bag of wristbands. He's like, what am I going to do with these wristbands? So what he did, thank you, sir, is he went and he started selling wristbands. 
He brought the money back. Thank you, sir. He brought the money back and bought more wristbands. Make a long story longer, he now buys, I think it's $25,000 a month in wristbands from a single village in the Philippines. Over 300 families that they're living from thread. All of the stuff that went on before doesn't happen anymore because now they have a job. He built a community center. He built a birthing center because women didn't have a place to go give birth that was clean. He built it. He built a high school because the kids were dropping out of school after elementary school because they had to catch a bus, go to another village, and they wouldn't do it. So he built a high school. He paid the teachers. He built a church. Paid the pastor. That church now has a 1,000 members, and they're tithing and taking care of their own pastor. He doesn't have to do that anymore. They're training, teaching, stewardship. They're hurting right now, I won't lie to you, because they sell all these wristbands at a lot of the Christian festivals. Guess what's not taking place right now? Yeah. And I, what I, I think what sold me the biggest on him is he still has to raise his own money to be, own support to be there. He, doesn't, he does not get a nickel of this. He has to raise his own support. But the thing that really connected with me was that he had six months of salary stored up so that if nobody bought a single wristband, he could pay them for six months. Well, that's been eaten into with all this COVID craziness. So now um, the guy is like, he's still going, man. I just I have the greatest respect for him because you call him up, and I'll tell you, Threads of Hope, look him up. I think there's a brochure out there, threadsofhope.com slash ph or something like that. I'll get you the address if you want it. Um, you call him up and say, hey, I'd like to get some of these, these gospel wristbands. And if you promise to give them away, he sells them to you for thir uh, 30 cents a piece. Can't sell them. That's why I'm not selling these to you. I'm giving them to you. He'll sell them, or he'll sell them to you for 30 cents a piece. Those other got wristbands that are out there, he sells them to you for a dollar. Full disclosure. He said, you keep a buck, I keep a buck. I don't keep a buck. <laughs> it all goes to him, right? But here's the thing, man. This guy is just still sending it out. And if you don't sell all the wristbands that you asked for, you send them back and he'll refund what you didn't sell. He's got over a million dollars in outstanding people that owe him. If people paid what they had taken from him and they never followed through on there, they wouldn't have a worry in the ministry. But the guy still does it. I don't see many ministries that do that. Now, these are special. Those other wristbands are a little bit more complex. You know, you look at the design, they're a little complex. But these are special because it's a simple design. But it's also special because of the message that most of you in here know. Matter of fact, there's a very nice little tract out on the uh, tract wall at the back as you're exiting to the left. There's a wonderful tract that would go beautifully with this thing. You see, everybody thinks that if they had gold, man, you look at that gold. If I had gold, I'd be rich. I'd be so happy. What a great life I would have. Uh, my dad made a quarter of a million dollars a year wrestling in the 60s. He died living in a $3,000 trailer, taking tolls in a toll booth, and there's probably not one person in this room that really knew who he was. If you think that uh, fame is going to make you happy, if you think money is going to make you happy, whatever you sell out for, if the world can give it, the world can take it away. But that gold represents heaven, and nobody can take that away from us. The only problem is, is that we can't get there. Why? Because, well... We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So what a sad story that you've got a beautiful place that you can't get to it. But it's not sad. Why? Because God became a man. His name was Jesus. He came. He died. He shed his blood on a cross. And it says that whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. You're washed white like snow. You're given a new heart, a new mind. You're a new creation because of what he did. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what's been done to you. What matters is what he did for you. And then that green... Well, you look outside, the grass is green. Guess what? Beautiful time of the year. We get to mow twice a week, three times a week. If it's green, it's growing. Well, that reminds me that I need to be alive and growing in my faith. You can now share the gospel in 90 seconds. So, when I check into hotels, typically, I didn't do it this last time, but typically I'll have these in my pocket, and I didn't. I left them in my uh, bag until Pastor Brian said, hey, I'm going to tell people about the threads. And I'm like, Carl, what are you doing? Um... I will tie it on their wrist, tell them the story. And then I share the gospel with them. It's like, here's what it really stands for. And then I do this. By the way, it's not free. What kind of a response do you think I get? Man, I 
thought this guy was nice. Now he's tied it on my wrist. And, and they just give you these eyes, and you're like, you want to ask me anything? Okay, how much? No, 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 no. That's not the cost. Here's the cost. Ready? If you took one and you're wearing one, you need to take another one and share that message with somebody. Ah, that was a horrible throw. So if you're going to wear one, you need to share one. We have a message of hope, and we're afraid to open our mouth. Get over it. If our Savior can die for us, we can talk about him. And that's what I want to do. That's what I pray that this is all about. So if you're going to wear one, make sure you take another one that you're going to share, because uh, you're going to run into some folks who need to hear it. So please do that. So Richard Dawkins, he proves evolution is true. He bumped. <laughs> we're going to address that. Deuteronomy 31.6 says... Uh, this, when I turn this thing on, then it'll probably work. Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is going to go with you, he's not going to fail you, he's not going to forsake you. If we, body of Christ, really believe that, held on to that, I think it would change the way that we are perceived in the culture, or even if we are perceived in the culture at all. 400,000 churches and almost invisible, there's something wrong. How can it be that we have that many Christians and we're almost visible. I'm going to suggest to you it's because you can only talk about what you know about. And unfortunately, too many sitting in church pews are very shallow in their understanding of the Word of God and how to apply it, and even more so how to live it. And a part of the reason is because of the topics that we've covered already. These are topics that I will, will I have covered at camp. And uh, so I'm, I'm sorry for those of you that have been to the camp and are hearing this again. I know that uh, that's probably boring for you, and I apologize for that. Uh, we can do new stuff, but I, I figured for the adults here, because I didn't, I didn't realize they were going to have some of the kids come in, uh, but for the adults, you need to hear what I'm teaching to the kids. I think that's important that you know what I'm teaching to your children, to your kids that are coming from your churches. This is what we're doing, all right? We're not pulling punches with them. We're coming after them. We're having a blast. That's why I told you I love what Whispering Cedars is doing, because very few camps give me the freedom to do what I do, and it's off the wall. I get it. But we have a generation that needs to know how to apply their faith. So I like to take real-world applications. Richard Dawkins, do you know who he is? Richard Dawkins is not a nice guy when it comes to Christians and Christianity. He's a very angry, nasty guy. He's probably one of the most visible atheists in the culture today. Uh, emeritus fellow of New College, Oxford, was the University of Oxford's professor of public understanding up until 2008. He's now just more of a, a writer and a, just an overall general nasty guy. He showed up a while back at uh, Concerned Women for America in Washington, D.C. Wendy Wright was the president at that time, and he showed up unannounced, and he walked in with a film crew. And this is the way that Richard Dawkins operates, and I'll be very blunt with you. I think he's a punk. And I know that's probably not a nice thing to say as a Christian. We're supposed to be nice. No, the guy's a punk. Because when it comes down to it, there are guys like uh, Richard Lane Craig, these very intelligent men that love to do debates and love to do this type of thing. I'm not one of them. I get too angry. I would be a horrible debater because I'd get mad and throw something at somebody. And so you lose, right? Done. Well, he won't debate them. He won't debate anybody with any kind of a knowledge. What he does is he shows up for someone that this isn't their topic with a film crew. He'll debate pastors that he handpicks and mocks and ridicules, and most of the time they're pastors that are compromising on the Word of God. So that's the kind of guy that he really is. And to me, it's like, look, if you're so tough, take on the big guys. Bring on the big dogs. If you're the man, be the man. So I got that video, and I watched it, and I just got frustrated at it. I got really frustrated at it for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't like the way that he, he did what he did. I thought it was very disrespectful. But number two, I felt bad because Wendy Wright, if she had had a stronger foundation, could have done so much better. And it just was representative of what I see in the Christian community sometimes. We have this wonderful faith, this wonderful belief, but when it comes to giving specific answers for the reason for the hope that lies within us, kind of fall short because apologetics just really truly isn't taught that much in the church today. And I think that's a, a problem. I would highly encourage you that have youth, please get them into faith where they have an apologetics program. Their, your children need to have that. That worldview component is so vitally important. 
as I watched that video, though, there were things that I was watching saying, okay, here's tools that I see that are being used in the culture that are causing us to get to the point where we're doubting. We're afraid to open our mouth. And one of the big tools that's used to get us to doubt is condescension. And Richard Dawkins is a master of using it. And by the way, I use it quite a bit, especially when I'm in the school type setting. I'll ask a question. The students will answer. And I don't care what the answer is. I don't care if it's correct or not. I'll just look at them. What? You're joking, right? Are you kidding me? And you can't believe the number of times that the students will automatically get on the, uh, 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 and get like apologetic. And that's not the kind of apologetic that I want. They're sorry for speaking. I'm like, no, we need a boldness. That's what Hebrews is talking about, having therefore a boldness to approach the throne of thrones. Guys, condescension is a very effective tool. All you got to do is kind of like mock somebody a little bit, ridicule a little bit, and they shrivel. Sorry, guys, this culture is different. And if you're not able to withstand a little bit of that, you're not going to be visible in this culture. It's not going to happen. So let me give you an example. This is a short clip, but I can expound on it, where Richard's in there with Wendy Wright. We're just going to pull clips from the whole interview. And audio. We need our audio turned up. Where did you study science is what he said. We'll get, it on, we'll get the audio going here. You know, this is probably the number one tool that's used against me when I get into conversations with those in uh, college campuses and everything. Because what happens is, is, well, where did you study science? Meaning that, well, you can't talk about these things unless you have a PhD in it, Carl. So you know what my response is? If you're going to try to restrict what I can say because I don't have a PhD in it, then I'm going to ask you, where did you study the Bible? Where did you get your degree in the Bible? Because Richard Dawkins, if you don't have a PhD in the Bible, then you shouldn't be talking about it if you don't want me talking about these things because I don't have a PhD in them. Where did you study Christianity? You got a PhD in Christianity? You got a lot to say about it. The question shouldn't be, where did you get your degree? The question should be, what we see, is it lining up with what he's saying or not? Is it true or not? Because you can have truth and not have PhDs. All right? We'll get to another clip here in a second. I look at a guy like Bill Maher. He does the same thing. They love to mock and ridicule. Oh, you know, they ignore real evidence. They aren't real scientists. They believe the earth is flat. Creationists aren't very intelligent people. And they love to toss around Christians and, and, and creationists and, and anybody that believes the Bible. And look how strong I am. Mock and ridicule these folks like they're not. Nah. Guys, you don't have to be that person. But when we do speak, and this is where I struggle sometimes, especially when I'm up here, God says when you speak, Give them the truth in love. And when I'm up here, sometimes you're like, man, he's not very loving. He's kind of like a jerk right now. Yeah, I am. I'm using sarcasm above and beyond. Why? I'm trying to keep you awake. You've eaten lunch. It's afternoon. It's warm. Those three things right there combined mean we're sleeping. So I'm going to use sarcasm. I'm going to use a little bit of this, but I guarantee you this. When you see me talking to lost people, that is not who I am. It's not mocking. It's not ridiculing because they are going to spend eternity in one of two places, just like every other person on this planet. And if they don't know God, that means hell. And that's nothing to mock or ridicule over. That's something that our hearts should be breaking over. So there's no mocking or ridiculing when I'm talking with people, but I am going to try to keep you awake. So what about the evidence? What is the evidence that he uses to really go after Wendy Wright? Because this is the same evidence he uses with everybody, and if he's using it, I'm guaranteeing you this. If he's using these things, the minions are using these things. The, the, the followers are using these things, so learn from the kingpin. Yeah, I did. Again. Try it again. I'm sorry, but we can show you the evidence. All you need to do is read an elementary textbook of biology. It's all there. Well, uh, inter that's interesting you should bring out the textbooks on biology. We still have textbooks today. Yeah, I know you're going to talk about paper moths and you're going to talk about Haeckel's embryos. No, no. Uh, in fact, what I was going to talk about is the, what they claim to be the evolution of a fetus in the womb yes. based on Haeckel's hand embryos. drawings. Yeah which have been proven to be false, and yet they continue to be published in sci scientific textbooks. 
Heckel's embryos are just one little thing. It's a Victorian thing. Plenty of people made mistakes in And Victoria. yet continues to be published in today's textbooks. Well, no longer, actually. But, but I don't think it's really fair, is it, to pick on particular Victorian mistakes. It is a Victorian mistake. Oh, I mean, but it was carried over into the 20th date? century. Yes, and that was a mistake, and, and that's been corrected. Did you catch the condescension, by the way? Mr. Phil, what, what museum did this come from, by the way? You know? Okay. ADD. He brought this to me, and I'm looking at it, and it's like, I want to know where it comes from so that I can use it and uh, study it correctly. You catch the condescension? Read an elementary textbook on biology. It's all there. Just read an element. I have read an elementary textbook on biology. As a matter of fact, I've got 17 textbooks on biology that are used in the public schools at my home right now that I go through and I read and check to make sure that what I'm teaching is still being taught. Embryonic recapitulation, big word, what's it mean? Nothing more than the child inside the mother's womb is going through these various stages replaying evolution. At one point, you have gills like a fish. At another point, you have a tail. At another point, you have a yolk sac like a bird, right? And, and you have a heart with this many chambers like a, a reptile, and then it goes to mammal. And this is what they basically teach, is that as a child develops inside the mother's womb, it's retracing, re replaying the steps of evolution. And what did he say? He said that was a mistake and that's been corrected. Well, here's the, the images that go back where this star really started from. Ernst Haeckel, remember we talked about him last night, the guy who was the bulldog for Charles Darwin's book. He's the guy that made all the drawings. This is one of his drawings. And Gosh, Carl, I mean, you look at the top, they're very, I mean, if you didn't know the bottom part there, if you just looked at that top row, you would be very hard pressed to identify which one of those was a human. I mean, you look down at the bottom, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a human. I mean, the stages are so similar. Well, there's some things that we need to know about these drawings. Haeckel's drawings are misleading in three ways. Number one, they include only the classes and orders that come closest to fitting Haeckel's theory. He removed two classes of vertebrate to make them all look similar. So he didn't give you all the information. He just gave you the pieces that he wanted you to have. Okay? In 1894, Adam Sedgwick rejected the idea that embryos start out similar and diverge over time, stating that this view is not in accordance with the facts of development. That's 1894. This was already rejected. Every embryologist knows that early differences exist and could bring forward innumerable instances of them, quote unquote. He said, quote, I need only say with regard to them that a species is distinct and distinguishable from its allies from the very earliest stages all through development. They knew that they were different from the beginning, but those drawings show similarities. Why? Uh, they don't show the earlier stages of the development where the embryos look very different. These are all embryos at different stages, not the same stage, okay? They purposely distort the embryos that they're supposed to show. What do I mean by that? If you take a look at the drawings up here, these are the actual drawings from Haeckel. Let's compare them because today we could do all kinds of crazy things. We could take pictures of the embryos. We could take ultrasounds of them. Yeah, that fish one looks, uh, yeah, very... Uh, See, the actual embryos are not so clean. And by the way, oh, Carl, we no longer teach this. That's no longer taught. That's been corrected, right? Let me take you to the college, because I got the elementary, the, uh, the, the school textbooks. Let me take you to the college textbook, and this is what it says. Early developmental stages of animals whose adult forms appear radically different are often, often surprisingly similar. Neo-Darwinian mechanisms explain why embryos of different species so often resemble each other in early stages, and as they develop, seem sometimes to replay the steps of evolution. You do not. You never had gill slits. You have pharyngeal pouches, which have nothing to do with respiration, like gills. Very different. You never had a tail. But Carl, it's very clear. You see the embryo. There's a, there's a tail, and we have a tailbone. Anybody ever hear that? Got a tailbone? And that's just vestigial organ from when we used to be these ape-like creatures and we had tails. Okay, so it's not very important if it's a vestigial organ. Then let me ask you this. Have any of you ever fallen on it? Anybody? Ever fallen on your tailbone? Did it hurt? And for a while. Why? Because it is a primary, of a primary importance for you to be able to walk upright. 
If you didn't have that tiny bone, which is a major attachment for all the muscles in your, in your stomach, so that you can walk upright and your intestines don't fall out. That little tiny bone is not some insignificant thing that's just a leftover. It's vitally important to what it does. And it's not a tailbone, it's a coccyx. And well, but, but, but it's at the end. Hello, if something has a beginning, it has to have an end. It's the end of the spinal column. That's all it is. But we gave it tailbone and it gives you this belief that it used to have a tail. By the way, I've heard reports, children, babies, they're born with tails. Not true. Go do the research. Guys who debated this used pictures that were photoshopped depicting a child with a fully developed tail. It was photoshopped. It was not real. Carl Giberson's the guy that did this in his debates, and then he got called out on it, and it was proven false. Now, are there children that are born with deformities that have a fatty cyst? Yes. Are there any vertebrae in there, any bones in it? No. It's a fatty cyst, and it's almost 99.9% .9 of the time, it's associated with the fact that these poor children can't even walk. It's a deformity. It's not, it's not a tail. It's not even close. By the way, they know that this isn't right. Matter of fact, Douglas Fudiyama, in his textbook, wrote this. Right? They know it's not right. They knew it back in the 1890s that it wasn't right. As such, if textbooks use the drawings at all, it is a historical example and as a way to illustrate the concept in such a way that students are able to grasp it immediately. Even if the drawings are fraudulent, they can still be used for this purpose because the concept they illustrate is by no means fraudulent. So, help me understand. I was talking with somebody here just yesterday, I believe that it was, and they were talking about this exact scenario. So, help me understand this. It's okay to use fake drawings to prove a true point. Hello? If it's true, why don't you use true pictures, true drawings to prove your point? Maybe if it's not true, you can't give the evidence to support it. So another tool that's used to get us to doubt is deception. And you better learn this. When Satan doesn't play fair, he doesn't have to. Why? Because Scripture's clear. John 8, 44 tells us he is the father. You are the father, the devil, and the lust of your father you're going to do. He was a murderer at the beginning, and he didn't abide in the truth because there is no truth in him liar and there's no shame in lying so we want that evidence though I, I i still want that evidence what's the evidence that he uses to prove his position let's let him keep going next part is a montage now listen carefully this is a montage i'm telling you that because i'm not trying to distort what he says or anything but you need to listen carefully and critically and let's see if we can't find some pieces that he that he's doing and see if we can't address them or even beyond that, surely there'd be at least one There's a evidence. a massive amount of evidence. I'm sorry, but you people keep repeating that like a kind of mantra, because you, you just listen to each other. I mean, if only you would just open your eyes and look show at the Show it evidence. to me. Show me the, well, show me the bones. Show me the carcass. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. Every time a fossil is found which is in between one species and another. You guys say, ah, oh, now we've got two gaps where, there, where previously there was only one. I mean, almost every fossil you find is intermediate <laughs> with something and something else. If that else. were the case, the Smithsonian National His Natural History Museum would be filled with these examples, well, but it, instead it they're is. not. Hmm. Did you catch the condescension? You people. He said this, did he not? It's a massive amount of evidence, right? You said that, am I right? A massive amount of evidence. You know, I'm always asking when I have the youth, especially in the classroom and on the camp type setting, can somebody give me a specific number for a massive amount of evidence? What, at what point does something become like a massive amount? I mean, 1,000, 10,000, 10, I don't know. At what point? It depends on what you're talking about. I know that. It depends on what you have. But I wonder what... A massive amount. What would justify a massive amount of evidence? Well, listen carefully, because I'm going to let him defend his position. He's got a massive amount of evidence, so listen carefully. Montage time. That last one wasn't a montage. Sorry, this is the montage. Listen to the montage and see if you can't identify some things. Now, in the case of humans, uh, since Darwin's time, there's now enormous amount of evidence about intermediates in human fossils, and we've got various species of Australopithecus, for example, uh, and these are 
mean, some Australopithecus are pithecus are intermediate between others and ourselves. Then you've got Homo habilis, Homo erectus. These are intermediate between Australopithecus, which was an older species, and um, Homo sapiens, which is a younger species. I mean, why don't you see those as intermediates? Mm. And I just told you about Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. A beautiful, by the way, archaic Homo sapiens and then modern Homo sapiens. That's a beautiful series of You're intermediates. You're still lacking the material evidence. The so material evidence is there. <laughs> go to the museum and look so at it. Now, I presented you with, I don't have them here, obviously, but you can go to any museum and you can see Australopithecus, you can see Homo habilis, you can see Homo erectus, you can see archaic Homo sapiens and modern Homo sapiens. A beautiful series of intermediates. Why do you keep saying, present me with the evidence? when well, I've done so. Go to the museum and, and look. And I'm not convinced have you seen Homo ha Have you seen Homo erectus? Have you seen Homo erectus? Have you seen Homo habilis? Have you seen Australopithecus? If I'm, I'm talking about facts, I'm talking about um, I've, I've told you about certain fossils, and every time I ask you about them, you evade the question and you turn to something else. But I have told you about four or five <laughs> fossils, and you seem to simply be ignoring what I'm saying. And I, and Why I... don't you go and look at those fossils? Did you observe anything in that montage? There's a massive amount of evidence, right? Four or five. Ooh. What are we going to do? We are so toast. He's got four or five fossils that he mentioned. Do you think you could learn something about four or five fossils? Yeah. Don't be so intimidated by this stuff. If I'm the son of a professional wrestler and I can learn this stuff, you can learn this stuff. Listen. Watch this. You said there are no fossil intermediates. And when I told you about fossil intermediates, you changed the subject. <laughs> See, one of the things that I'll point out, especially when I'm working with younger generations, when he first started off in that clip before this one, he was the professor. You know, you got various species of Australopithecus, you got Homo habilis, you got Homo erectus, you got Archaic Homo sapiens. He's the professor doing the teaching. But by the end of it, he's wound up, right? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Why? Because of this right here. You said there's no fossil intermediates, and when I told you about them, you changed the topic. This is the problem that I think with many Christians. Because we get these guys like this, and they start mentioning very specific things. What about Homo erectus? What about Homo habilis? What about Australopithecus? And we're like, ooh, I'm out of here. We need to be able to give an answer why we believe what we say we believe. And it's not that difficult with these things. He's, he said this, but I could say this, quite frankly. I want you to look at the facts. Don't believe what you've been told, that there's no evidence. Just go look at the evidence. Amen. He says, I want you to go to the museums and look at the facts and don't believe what you've been told that there's no evidence. Just go look at the evidence. I could sign my names to those statements. I really could. Why do I lead towards the museums? Why do I lead towards the zoos? Because I want you to go look at the evidence. And when you do, you're going to see that you have nothing to be afraid of when you start with the Word of God as your authority and your standard. Now, a tool that's used to get us to doubt is intimidation. And he uses it very well. Okay? So we've got four or five fossils. What could we do about that? Well, here's what I want to do. Just take a brief moment. He said you've got an enormous amount of evidence about intermediates and human fossils, various species of Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Archaic Homo sapien, and modern Homo sapien. Let's be real blunt here and just cut to the chase. Archaic Homo sapien and modern Homo sapien. What is that? People. That's what it is. It's people. So you got people that lived in caves. Oh, you got cavemen. Yeah, people that lived in caves. There are cavemen alive today. There are places on this planet that people still live in caves. But they're people. And then you have various species of Australopithecus. I already gave you the answer to this. What does Australopithecus mean? Southern ape. So you got apes and you got people. And that's the examples that he gives. But where does it come from? Right here. I told you all I was going to add this into the talk. I'm changing it up from what I typically do. Because this is the chart that started that whole, every other chart that you've ever seen, start with the ape-like ancestor up to the humans, goes back to this one. It's called the March of Progress. And what blew me out of the water is a couple years ago, as a child, my mom and dad bought me a set, the Life Nature Library. Anybody remember this? Any of you um, middle-aged folk? It was a set of like 12, 13 books. My mom and dad bought me the whole set. I have one from when I was like eight, nine years old. So this thing is like 50 years old, right? 
That's the book. That's the only one that I have. I've had it for all these years, and I never read it. I looked at the pictures, but I never read it. So here's the chart. Take it straight out of it. More people saw the chart than they saw the book, because what happened is that the chart became so popular, almost every school on the planet ordered the chart to put up on the walls in the biology classes, and we never read it. So now I've got this book, and I look at it, and I started reading it for the first time. I was like, are you kidding me? This is what was used to prove, and I had no doubt that evolution was a fact. I mean, come on, how are you going to argue with that? Gosh, it's so obvious. Pliopithecus. This is what it says, okay? This is what it says. Long considered to be ancestral to Gibbons, the Pliopithecids are now known to be far removed from Gibbons or indeed any other living primates. What does that mean? It's not in the human lineage. It's not in the human lineage. It's indeed any other primate. We're primates. Huh. Proconsul. What about the next one? Proconsul. Proconsul is considered to be a very early ape, the ancestor of the chimpanzee and perhaps of the gorilla. So it's not in the human lineage. Dryopithecus. David Begun of the University of Toronto in Canada reanalyzed uh, re 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 fossils of Dryopithecus apes. Uh, of what? Uh, which lived in what is now Europe as early as two and a half million years ago. He says that the characteristics of the skull suggest that rather than evolving earlier than the great apes, as was previously thought, Dryopithecus was actually a great ape itself. Said this, what if Dryopithecus, that looks like a little gorilla, really was a little gorilla, that had already branched off from human beings? So guess what? Not in the human lineage. How about this one? Oh, Oreopithecus. And this isn't the cookie monster. This is, this is the Oreopithecus, all right? A likely side branch on man, man's fam, family tree. What's that mean? Not in the human lineage. It goes on, and the same thing was clearly an aberrant ape. What's that mean? It's not in the lineage. Oreopithecus fossils are poorly preserved, and some of the bones are crushed, making it difficult to draw definitive conclusions. So much for that one. Ramopithecus. Ooh, what are we going to do now? Ramopithecus was thought to be a distinct genus that was the first direct ancestor of modern humans, Homo sapien, before it became regarded as that of the orangutan ancestor, Civopithecus. So guess what? Not in the human lineage. Africanus. Oh, what are we going to do? Africanus possessed brains the size of apes, had ape-like skulls, and was similar in body shape and size to apes. Hello? Anybody want to go out on a limb here and think maybe where it came from? It's an ape. Australopithecus robustus. Oh, what are you going to do now? He represents an evolutionary dead end in man's ancestry. Are you, are you seeing what's going on here? All of, they've got all these really cool pictures showing these things, one walking to the other, and not a one of them. We're in the human lineage. So here's what I did. I read the whole, I'm skipping... The rest of them, because it's the same thing. This is in the original book, and you didn't see this when you just bought the chart. The text right there says this. <laughs> I read this up, all right? It says, all, uh, although proto-apes and apes were quadrupedal, all are shown here standing for the purpose of comparison. Hello? What does that mean? Every one of those that you see right there on the screen are the proto-apes. Not a one of them walked upright. But they show it as walking upright. Why? Because it made it look so dramatic. What that chart actually shows you are apes and humans that they stuck together to come up with this great chart. And by the way, there was another interesting quote early on that said this right here. It says, it is a revealing story, not only for the creatures it shows, but also because it graphically illustrates how much can be learned from how little. This is the book that I've had for 50 years that I never read. Many of the figures shown here have been built up from far few fragments. A jaw, some teeth perhaps, as indicated by the white highlights, and thus are products of educated guessing. And we have people abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ because they're being taught this mess, but they're not being taught the full story on it. 
What about Archaic Homo sapien? What is Archaic Homo sapien? Um, yeah, well, we're in trouble because, Carl, that's Neanderthal man. I mean, we've all seen the pictures of Neanderthal man, right? I mean, this is a scary guy. I'm not going to lie to you. If, if, if you came out uh, and walking down a dark alley one night, and this guy just walks out in front of you, I would be intimidated. That is a scary looking dude. Look at the eyebrow ridges on that joker. I mean, and talk about dental plans. This is a man that needed a dental plan. It's obvious he came from the apes. Look at the chompers and look at the eyebrow ridges. By the way, if you want to tell me that just because something has big eyebrow ridges that they came from the apes, you tell, this to the, to, you tell it to this guy. He's a seven-foot-tall professional boxer. And if you're feeling froggy, jump. I'm not telling the dude that he came from apes. Just because somebody has big eyebrow ridges doesn't mean anything. I have seen human beings with crazy eyebrow ridges. I'm speaking in California, in the mountains of California. It was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, father-son retreat, right? One of the guys that showed up is an MMA fighter, and I know I've already talked about it once. I like the MMA. I do. I, I studied karate for years. Uh, I love it. I just love the, the athleticism that's involved. I just, it's, it's an art. It really is. Not so much into the beating and the blood, not that. Not that. But I, I do love the technique. I mean, being able to throw somebody that, my, my instructor was like, yay tall, and weighed maybe a third of what I weigh. And dude would throw me like crazy. And I liked it. It was like, this is cool. And it was like, so I'm out there, and this MMA, MMA guy comes up. His name, and I, I'm going to butcher his name, Rafael de Sanos. He's like a middleweight champion or whatever. He's got crazy eyebrow ridges. So I walk up to him. I say, man, uh, can I use you as an illustration tonight? You'd promise not to beat me up? <laughs> he let me use him. I mean, look, just because somebody's got big eyebrow ridges doesn't mean they came from the apes. You know, one of the things that stinks about being a guy, guys, is the longer we live, the bigger our eyebrow ridges get. It just naturally grows. But if you do any kind of sport, like the wrestling or MMA, and you're bumping it, it grows even quicker. By the way, if you had guys that live 500, 600, 900 years, I wonder if I shouldn't expect to find some skulls that have big eyebrow ridges. I'm just saying. What about Neanderthal man? Let me take you to History Channel. Ape to man. This is not a Christian source. What do they have to say about Neanderthal man? Neanderthal seems so promising when it's first presented. It seems like it's going to be the answer. But on closer inspection, it starts to fall apart. Most importantly, the key fossils just seem to be too much like humans. Neanderthal, at best, is a man with some ape qualities. So there you go with Archaic Homo sapiens. Oh, Cro-Magnon man, Indian. Look very much like Indians today. Pretty much accepted to be Indian. Okay? That's it. So there's all these fossils that supposedly should tell us that there's no God. Neanderthal man, when they first found the bones, that's how they drew Neanderthal man, was depicted like that. That's a scary guy. I mean, by the way, you find a bone. This is your evidence, bones. You know how much hair they had on their body from a bone? Think about it. You got a bone. Ooh, that guy, he had hair down to his knees. Man, he was bald in a cue ball. It's a bone. How do you know how much hair they had on their body? How did you know that, look at the toenails on that guy. Not only did he need a dental plan, he needed a pedicure. He would kill you with those toenails. And you know how long the toenails are because you got a, you got a bone? Oh, but later they found more bones. And then they drew Neanderthal. This is Neander Valley where they found the first Neanderthal bones in Germany. This is the museum they have over there. They found more. And look at the drawing. He lost all the hair off of his body. He's walking more upright. He's not hunched over anymore. He's got to wear animal skins to keep him warm. Today, this is the way they depict Neanderthal man, looking like a Baptist pastor. <laughs> you know, what I find so interesting, I've been doing this for a long time now. It's very interesting. When I started, one of the guys, I, I, was, I had a chance, I believe it was you that we were talking about, Dr. Dwayne Gish. Dr. Gish is a guy that, if you want to go back and watch some interesting things, Dr. Gish debated anybody. I think when he finally passed away, he had over 500 debates. He debated anybody. And I, I was privileged to travel with him for a while. He mentored me. Uh, I got to be with him at a few of the debates. And uh, 
He was a character. <laughs> he was a character. When you knew him off away from people, guy was a character. That looks just like Dwayne Gish. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now. If you put glasses on him, that looked just like Dwayne Gish. And what I find interesting is that a missing link has evolved into a creationist, okay? So there's all that evidence. I mean, uh, various species of Australopithecus, we went through that in the, home, uh, in the uh, human talk. The Lucy is not in the human lineage, no longer accepted, and neither are any of the other Australopithecines, not a one. So that means we're left with humans and apes. What are we going to do? I'm not going to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ for that. I know that. Here's a book, right? The Cambridge. Hello. There's a respected name, right? Cambridge, Encyclopedia of Human Evolution. I paid $55 for this book. I will sell it to you cheap. I just needed the one picture. I scanned it in. So I'll sell you the book. There it is. There's the ancestry. That proves that we evolved from ape-like ancestor. Anything look interesting to you? Yeah, I made them bigger so you could see them. But I didn't add them. Those are there. I just made them bigger. There's 11 of them. And guess where they always take place? Where evolution is supposed to have happened. Guys, if all you got are question marks and dashed lines, I'm feeling pretty good with what I got. Matter of fact, there's the human family tree that I told you. You want to give me three hours of your life? We'll go through every one of them. That's the Smithsonian version right there. The human family tree. Well, guess what? I don't like that layout. So here's what I'm going to do. The button on the right side... I'm going to put my finger on it, and when I put my finger on it, all i got to do is drag it down, and I totally rearrange the evidence. This is how it worked. It didn't work the other way. It worked this way. I don't like that one either. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drag it down one more time. This is evolution at its core. I give you a bunch of pieces, and you can rearrange them in whatever pattern You know, there's a cartoon that's used to make fun of Christians and creationists especially. you got a big mathematic formula, then a big mathematic formula. And to make it all work, to tie it all together, what do they do? Then a miracle occurs. And then the smart guy comes up and he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two, right? Well, guess what? This is their chart. Don Johansson, the guy who discovered Lucy, this is his chart. I took it straight out of his book. And by the way, do you notice anything interesting? The bold lines and the skinny lines? What do the bold lines mean? What do the skinny lines mean? Fable. Get rid of the fable. And if you want me to sell out the Lord Jesus Christ for this mess, I think you need to get a little bit more explicit here, a little bit more explicit here, a little bit more explicit here. You understand what I'm saying to you? If you're going to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ for this mess, all they have is one thing stay and one thing never change from or into anything else. Why would we walk away from Jesus Christ for this mess? But there must be more. I mean, come on. It can't be that easy. Well, take a listen. Look at the evolution of the horse. Look at the evolution of the elephant. There are evolution of the whale. There are so many beautiful stories. I mean, you'd be fascinated. You, you would think that these fossil histories are to the greater glory of God. If so only you go and would look it, at them. Would... Let's look at them. Every biology book that I have, every museum that I've ever gone to, has had the evolution of the horse in there as an exhibit to prove that evolution is a fact. There it is. What are you going to do? Well, here's one piece. You start with four toes, you get three toes, then you end up with one toe. It evolved over time. Really famous picture used in the textbooks. There's only one problem. The most famous of horse trends, gradual reduction of the side toe, is flatly fictitious. It's not even true. That's not what you see in the fossil record. Matter of fact, I bought the $60 book. I'll give you the package deal. $60 book on horse evolution all I needed was one picture. Do you see the dashed lines? Guess what the dashed lines mean? Secular quote. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky, and ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Uh, hold up, bunny trail here. We have fewer examples today for evolutionary transition than we did in Darwin's time. How many examples did they have in Darwin's time? Care to venture a guess? More than 10, less than 10. More than 50, less than 50. More than 100, less than 100. Zero. None. Matter of fact, Darwin suggested that the way that we got the whales is bears swimming around in ponds. 
And as the bears would swim around in ponds, they would scoop up insects on the surface of the water, which over time caused their mouth to get bigger, and then the bears became more aquatic and eventually became the whales. I didn't say that. He did. It was just as ridiculous as a mouse becoming a whale. Help me with math here. I'm not that smart. If you have fewer examples today and you had zero in the past, how is like negative three better than negative one? I mean, how, how, how? By this I mean that some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil records, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. Yeah, those, ori those, or those original charts don't hack it. They don't fit. How about this? How about this? I have to be honest. I hate to admit it, but I, I now know after years of research, evolution has happened in donuts. It's sad. I mean, I have to admit this. I, it, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't tell you what I've learned through years of study. Donuts have evolved. There's only two ways we got a donut. In the beginning, man made it, but my research shows very clearly that's not what happened. What happened was this, is that about 65 million years ago, we got a lump of dough. Where'd the lump of dough come from? I don't have a clue, but we got a lump of dough. And that lump of dough started having mutations. And what happened is, is that some of those lumps of dough got flat, turned into cookies, and some of those lumps of dough got puffy and turned into bread. But that's not my field of study. My field of study are donuts. And so some of those lumps of dough, they turn into the plain donut. And that's where I did start my study in the plain field. But I quickly moved into a very specific field of donut study. And some of those plain donuts had mutations, and they got the sprinkles and the, uh, those are girly donuts, okay? Sprinkles and foo-foo stuff, I don't do those. Uh, and then some of those plain donuts, they turn into the bagel, the bear claw. Oh, I have a PhD in donutology, but I have a uh, minor in bear claw-ology. I'm telling you right now, I know bear claws, bro. I know them, studied intensely. And then the Cheerio. And I can prove this all to you because, you see, I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they all came from the lump of dough because the donut, the bagel, the bear claw, the cookies, the bread, they are all 98% similar. So obviously they all came from the same source. Have any of you ever heard this claim that humans and apes share 98% of their DNA, so therefore we come from the same source? Go do research on it. I'll give you a video, secular video if you'd like to watch it. Do you know how they make humans and apes 98% similar? By removing 24% of the human genome and 18% of the ape genome. Get rid of those two. And then insert spaces to make them the same length. And oh, can you believe it? We're 98.77% similar with a chimpanzee. Yeah, if you take 24% and 18% and add insert spaces, if you go do the study, secular videos, I'll show them to you. I'll give them to you. You're going to find out that we're actually about 70% similar. Now, that's still really good. But it's not 98% similar. And to illustrate it for you like this, have any of you ever been driving and it started to rain? Anybody? Anybody? It started to rain, right? And the first thought that ran through your mind was, I better get under an underpass or my window's going to get busted out by a watermelon, right? I mean, that's the first thing that came to your mind. You didn't think that? You should be afraid. You should be very afraid. Because a raindrop and a watermelon are 98% similar. So one of these days. You're laughing. Look, it's not the 98% similar that's the problem. It's the 2% that's dissimilar, that's so dissimilar, there's no way they came from the same source. And it's the same thing with humans and chimps. They are dissimilar big time. But anyway, my field of study, the Boston Creamfield Donut. And I have started researching the malasada. Have you ever heard of a malasada? I'm telling you right now, you have not lived until you had a malasada. In Hawaii, it's a Portuguese donut. Oh, my goodness. As soon as we get off the plane there, the guy picks me up. I don't say a word. We go to the malasada truck. It's awesome. So there you go. There's my evidence for evolution of donuts. Do I have any new converts? Any new converts? Good, thank you very much. Uh, the dues are only $25 a month, and after six months, you get a free box of donuts. So. Oh, don't look at those. Don't look at those.
by the way, take a look at the evolution of the horse. Take a look at the evolution of the elephants. Take a look at the evolution of the, what was the last one he said? Whales. Friends, that is the evolution of the whales chart. That's it. All I did was replace the skulls with donuts and bagels and bear claws. Watch. Please. It's the same chart. People laugh at my donut example. That's the whale example. And you want me to give up on the Lord Jesus Christ because you've got a bunch of skulls with a bunch of dash lines and question marks? That's how many question marks. By the way, do you know what a question mark means in this context? Dawkins wants to make fun of Christians. Christians, all you have is faith. And faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Hello? All of your charts have question marks, dashed lines, different colored lines, different shaped lines, and every one of those means you have faith. Because there's no evidence to support what you're saying. That's faith. That is true blind faith. Christian, we don't have blind faith. We think of faith as a bad word. What is biblical faith? Biblical faith is based in the fact that he said he's going to do this, he did it. He said he's going to do this, he did it. He said he's going to do this, he did it. And now he said he's going to do this. I got a track record here. That's not blind faith. Blind faith are question marks and dashed lines. You see, guys, we need to teach this generation how to apply with this thing. And one more tool that's used to get us to doubt, bold-faced lies. And that's Richard Dawkins at the core. The guy's a liar. This whole time. Just look at the evidence. I'd be so happy if you just look at the evidence. If you would just say, okay, there's a God that used evolution. All right, I would agree with you. That would be okay, because at least you looked at the evidence. That's what he says. But you know what the truth is? There's a television program in England. I've been on it. This guy that's uh, Walt Congdon or something like that. He's the co-host, co or the host. He had Richard Dawkins on there, and I just happened to come across this video. And I want you to see... How deceitful he is. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy, um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. And I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. The whole time he's with Wendy Wright, just, just look at the evidence. And if you say that there's a God that used evolution, we're, we're okay. You see, he says that because he knows. The guy that I was, Oh, there's a God. He used evolution. Okay, yeah, that's okay. I was talking with Pastor here earlier, and I believe that what we are seeing in our culture, we are reaping what we have sown for a long time. We were a culture at one point that believed in a God that created the way that he said that he did, that his word was true from the beginning. Can I get an amen on that? That's where we were at one point in time. We weren't perfect, never have been. We're all sinners. But that's where we stood. Now we're over here. How in the world do you get from there to here? That's a huge chasm to get across. And I don't think you get, a, get across it just like that. I think you need a series of steps. One of those series of steps, one of the big steps to get from there, perfect creation, God did it the way that he said that he did, to, there is no God, is a God that used millions of years of death and suffering to get to where we are today. Because the minute I get you to bite off on the fact, well, yeah, there's a God, but he did this process to get there, this God is totally contradictory to what this book says. If I can get you here, that is an easy step. Because the God that used millions of years of death and suffering is not the God of the Bible. That's a very diabolical God, to be quite frank. Using cannibalism, cancer, brain tumors, all of that stuff is in the fossil record, supposedly, millions of years before Adam ever came along and sinned. So if that's a process that God used, what kind of a God do we serve? But if the biblical historical account is true, those aren't God's fault. They're our fault. Do I think that answering Dr. Dawkins, Bill Nye, Bill Maher, do I really think that it's going to change them? It's not my job. We are not called to 
change them. We are called to give an answer to the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. And that word answer literally means a logical, rational explanation. Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If we can pass it on to this younger generation and give them answers for their faith, I think good things will happen. I would ask for your prayers as I attempt to do just that. I praise God for the missionaries that are in there. I feel a kindred spirit with you. That's exactly what I believe that I am. I believe that I'm a missionary to a generation that is just getting beat up right now. My mission field isn't Liberia. Praise God, we need that. Not Peru. Praise God, we need that. My mission field is going after, for the most part, a younger generation that is flat getting chewed up and spit on. So I would covet your prayers. I appreciate the opportunities that you guys have given me at the camp, and I mean that. I mean that sincerely. I thank you for that. I thank you for Pastor Brian for the opportunities that he's had, for all the pastors that have let me in their church. I, I don't take this lightly. This is a, this is a huge privilege, and it's a, it's a huge opportunity. So I thank you for the time that you've given. I know it's been a long day but I appreciate you letting me be with you and let me ramble on. I hope some of this makes sense. Please support Faith Baptist Bible College. Please support the uh, Baptist Church planters. Please support the missionaries. Sorry, I don't know much about the insurance. <laughs> I'm bad on that stuff. Like, praise God, he gave me a wife. I don't understand any of that stuff. It's just like, man, I just want to go do ministry. So, covet your prayers. Father, I give this to you, and I ask that you would do something with it. Thank you for Pastor Brian and the commitment that they've made to host this, and the pastors that have come, the missionaries that have come. I pray that you would bless them in ways that they can't even begin to imagine. Lord, use us. Put someone in our path, even today, that we can share the love of Christ with. Help us to raise up a generation that is bold in their faith, not ashamed, not afraid, but speaking the truth in love. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Stand and sing together, Lord, we are glorified. Before we're dismissed. In my life, Lord, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. In our hearts, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in our homes, Lord, be glorified. people said it has been a good conference i appreciate you being here i need you to do me a favor before you leave i need you to take all your trash all your stuff all the candy and when you're leaving that table it should be perfectly clear okay of everything now here's what we're going to do about the flowers around here we appreciate our elders so if you share your birthdays with one another and you're the oldest one at your table that flower is yours today, okay? So you enjoy that. We appreciate that. It's, it, I think it's funny. The tables that are not talking, they just look at, the, obviously, the old guy over there. John got his flowers. So, so enjoy those.